every successful person got there by going through tough times. Success is a hard-ass teacher who likes to knock you around along that journey. You know, it takes real guts to not give up and keep going. We'll hear stories about failures and how these leaders flip the script to create success. I'm John Schultz. Join me and let's discover how success is never really overnight. Welcome to John Schultz podcast. I have an incredible guest. Uh, very much looking forward to uh, having this conversation. Mark Laurie. I'm going to read a little bit of his introduction. It's long, but I'm going to try to consolidate it. Right now, he's founder of Wonder, which is a mobile restaurant bringing chefs and cuisines to your front door. Uh, currently operating in New Jersey, but plans to expand nationally by 2035. Uh, it's amazing concept. We're going to talk about that. Wonder was valued at $3.5 billion in June 2002, which is amazing for such a early company. Obviously, uh, people believe in your concept. And he was also the founder of Jet.com, who sold to Walmart in 2016 for $3 billion in 18 months. The great story, which I've read a lot about, was Diapers.com, which uh, obviously everyone knows about. And you sold Quincy to Amazon, which had other brands under Diapers.com, which was the holding company. What I am very interested in, and I don't even know if we'll have time in this podcast, is you want to build this futuristic city known as Telosa. Now, I'm in real estate, so that sounds pretty exciting, and I'd love to learn more about that. And what every, at least me and all my friends, wanted one day in their life is to own a team, and you own the Minnesota Timber World. So that's very cool as well. So welcome, Mark. Thanks for coming on the show. Thanks, John. Uh, great to be here. All right, so let's get going. So, you know, sometimes I'll go to these events, and we'll have 10 people around the table, and I love meeting people. And- I'm gonna give a shout out to Bonnie Manter. She starts these meetings saying, what's the most interesting thing about yourself that's not in business? Now, I'm gonna ask you that question. I, I think I have one for you, but I'd like to ask you that question to start off. Hey, what's, what's your one for me? You got... <laughs> that you were actually qualified for the US national bobsled team in 1996. So for me, that's just like, how? How does anyone get to be a bobsledder? So, so I thought, like, if you told me that at this meeting, I would be like, oh, my God, I learned something new today that I never heard before. Yeah, that was uh, by by just sheer chance. So I was a, a D1, like, track and field athlete, sprinter, jumper. Um, and uh, one day, the U.S. bobsled team was uh, down at the World Financial Center, and they laid out a bobsled in a track. And they were raising money and building awareness for bobsled. And they basically like would time people pushing the sled down the track. And it was flat. And they basically said they're going to be there for a week. And the fastest time they're going to invite to Lake Placid to this tryout where they would test you. So I got a call and I was like a couple weeks, you know, after they they got down there, I, I had, you know, put my sneakers on and pushed it during, uh, during lunch hour while I was working in the bank. And then I got this call and said, hey, um, you had the fastest time pushing the sled. Would you like to come up to Lake Placid? And uh, no promises, but we'll test you. And if you pass the test, we'll train you. <laughs> and so I was like, hell, I, I mean, when are you going to get a chance to go up to Lake Placid? To you know, I thought it was just going to be fun to go up there. And, uh, and I'll say, oh, I'll take the test, meet the Olympians and stuff. So I went out there to Lake Placid and passed their test, you know, and, and they said, Hey, you had a great score. Um, we'd love to, uh, train you basically. And, uh, so I called work and said, uh, can I get a month off? Uh, I'm going to be trained and learn how to like do the bobsled <laughs> thing. And, uh, and they said, yes. And so I spent a month training in Lake Placid with these guys. And then they had the, uh, time trials, uh, pushing the sled. And, uh, I managed to, uh, to, to, to get the time that, that, that qualified for the, for the team. And I would have, it was a non-Olympic year, obviously. So I would have had to travel with the team for two years. Um, um, and I wasn't ready to, to sort of like one month was okay, but to give up two years, um, and not know if it was a definite or not, the Olympics was, was too much to give up. So it was a fun one month out of my life. And I love the story and, and, uh, 
you know, it's a great story. I mean, it's like Mark Wahlberg and Invincible. Like, I, maybe I'm going to produce this movie, right? If you, if you kept going, you could have had a movie. But you, you, listen, you, you you chose other things, which is great. So, okay, so this is about the myth of overnight success, and you know, at the end of the day, most people love to hear about you know the story of how someone became and all the things that and, and how hard it took to get there. So I, I read something that like when you were young, you grew up and you're growing up, you wanted to be a farmer. Like, yeah. why did that's another thing like Bob Sledder, farmer, like, yeah, no, know, so this I, is really, I actually have a, um, like a thing with like crayon from like really, really young, like four years old, where it doesn't even look like I knew how to write any, any, you know, somebody was doing it for me. Cause I, I still kept it. It basically said, what do you want to be when you grow up? And then it was like, it said a farmer. Um, and, uh, because they grow stuff from nothing. And my grandma, you know, I was the first person in my family to go to college. We grew up with no money in Staten Island, New York. And parents had me when they were 20 years old. So I spent a lot of time with my grandma and we would sit on her stoop in Staten Island. And she would always ask me, what do you want to be when you grow up? This is like four years, like, like little, 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 little. And I would say a farmer. And she says, no, no, no. Doctor or lawyer. Farmers don't make money doctor or lawyer and then she'd ask me and every time i'd say farmer and she would say no you want to be a doctor or a lawyer <laughs> so uh, there are no doctors or lawyers in my family or anything you know um and uh and you know it stayed true up through today i just love watching stuff grow and so it was people say like are you born with it or do you become it for me in my case i was just born wanting to build stuff and watch stuff grow like that was that was what really always, you know, motivated me. So do you think you're born an entrepreneur or can it be taught? I really think there's some like inherent personality traits that are sort of required to be a successful entrepreneur. I really do. Um, I think it's it's hard. Like people might want to be, but when you realize like what it takes, you're either like not willing to do it or just don't have the stomach for it. So I think it it requires you to deal in a very uncertain world where you have a high probability of failure. A lot of people, they like do the best they can to avoid anything with a low probability of failure. You know, like it's just not many people can stomach like just falling flat in your face, you know? So I think you gotta yeah, have the stomach for it. Um, you also have to be able to work a hundred hours a week and get into this like tunnel vision where like nothing else matters. And some people rightfully so like want balance in their life. <laughs> you know, They don't want to just go into a tunnel, um, you know, and work a hundred hours a week on something. So I think the combination of having that work ethic and your ability to, to take risk and be very, very comfortable with failure and comfortable with change, rapid change. So if you, if you have those traits, then I think anybody could create a successful business and be be successful. But without that, man, it's a, it's going to be really hard. Yeah, I mean, it's like you got to get very comfortable with never knowing what's going to happen, right? And yeah. uncertainty is going to have to be in your DNA and that you know you'll get through it, but never really how, I yeah. guess. And right? you got to be a goldfish. You have to have a really short memory on this stuff because- like in ordinary life, people deal in, you know with adversity and then they think about it and dwell on it and spend time you know on it and and worry about the future. And in a startup land, there's zero time to think about what went wrong or worry about what might go wrong. Like zero. Like you just there's no time. And for many people, that's just not possible. Like they just can't, they can't be goldfish. They can't forget. Um, and and if they can then they'll worry about the future and that doesn't work. So you're, so you're saying goldfish. I think like my, I have two dogs, they forget the next second, yeah. right? So I guess they <laughs> fall into that category too. So do you think your parents had anything to do with this attitude that was created of being yeah. a goldfish or do oh, you yeah, feel- I mean, my, my parents were, were, especially my dad was like really uh, hands-off. I would just say that nicely hands-off, but uh, he- was a crazy risk taker and he well, like let me fail um on, on so many things you know from everything from oh you want to learn how to ride a bike bring me to the top of a hill put me on the bike and push me down 
you know, when I, when I sort of crashed onto, onto the windshield, you know, and then I'm like, yeah. okay, all right. So like, <laughs> you know, next time I'll be, I'll be more ready, you know, um, <laughs> like it was, uh, yeah, I just, I just grew up with a lot of failure. And so I, 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 and academically too. So I was a terrible student, you know, I had my, my parents con convinced a C meant correct on the report card. <laughs> that, listen, that's a good persuasion technique. I like that one. <laughs> so I, you know, I didn't, I wasn't a student. I was more of an athlete, you know, jock kind of, kind of guy growing up kid. Yeah. And uh, I, um, I didn't take school seriously, didn't do well. And, you know, just experienced a lot of like adversity when it comes to like grades and school and just learning things by failing. And so I was always comfortable like with it never scared me to to fail or go into things saying you might fail because I know what that felt like and I was okay with it and I just quick quick learn when I fail I I quickly learn and then forget learn and forget learn and forget I if you ask me like talk to me about the failure of like I, I just blocked it out of my memory it's erased it I, I kept the, the learning I can tell you what the learning was I just couldn't tell you anything about about the failure because I just don't want to like uh, you blocked it out. Yeah, I blocked it out. I don't waste yeah. time on that. Or right. I have a small. I like to say I have a small memory card, um, so I, I have to like clear shit out of there. Um, well, it's like that movie Fifty First Dates. Imagine waking up every day and forgetting everything that happened the day before with Adam Sandler. I mean, yeah, no. <laughs> you don't want that to be. But I, I, I think in anything in any pursuit, you got to keep moving forward, and everything's a learning, and you, you, you just keep moving, right? Just keep yeah. moving. Yeah. So, all right. But, you know, here you are, you're, you're in Staten Island. I guess you moved to Jersey, which is, you know, love that you did that. And you had an entrepreneurial streak by going through all this stuff as a kid. I guess you started with baseball cards. I read like, like, I did how everything. did you get into that? I literally anything a kid could do from lemonade stand, car wash, lawn mowing service, recycling business, um, pulling weeds, shoveling snow, building a baseball card business where we, you know, buy cards direct from the manufacturer, make full sets all summer and sell them at trade shows, like anything to make a buck. And, you know, so you I, didn't go to camp. You weren't one of those people that went was, to camp. No, I, I was, I was working, you know, hustling, trying to, trying to make a buck over the summer. You know, knowing you know, Jersey, I used to push carts at food town. And then I worked as the track as a valet Parker. So I, I, I did the same thing. I love figuring out, and, in college, I actually sold sweatshirts. So like, I was always trying to figure out as well how to like, and it wasn't the money. It was just like you said, something yeah. from nothing, something yeah. from nothing, right? And like, yeah. like yeah. trying to accomplish. I love that. I did the All right, so, too, so you did that and you uh, obviously you just riffed off like 15 things that most people don't do when they're younger. How did you then, you went to college, right? I, I, I obviously, uh, I heard a great story that, you know, you thought like you just apply and you get in like, oh, yeah, I want to go to that school. So so let me just send it in and then I'm going. And I, yeah, I mean, I didn't know it. Learn any of this stuff. My parents hadn't been to college. So that's, I'll never forget. It was sophomore year. I'm walking down that. the hallway. And I remember this like it was yesterday walking down the hallway and some kids said, hey, hey, Mark, how you doing? Hey, like you are starting to think about college. Like, have you thought about where you want to go? And I just said, because I know this is a good school. Like you're a kid. And I'm like, Harvard. <laughs> and they're like he's like harvard what are you talking about like, you know he knew i wasn't a good student he's like what are you right. talking about you you can't get in harvard no disrespect and i'm like well, what, what do you mean get in don't don't you just like say you want to go there and i don't know like pay a I fee love that. um and it's like no you got they got to accept you and that's when i was like oh shit <laughs> i better i better like start studying so right, exactly it was too late though. I started to study a little bit in junior year, but um, yeah. But you got, you went to college, right? Which is a good thing. I it, guess it, it was a track and field, luckily, fortunately. So that um, helped you. Yeah. Love it. So in college, right? You uh, did track and field, you sort of what made your way through it. So how did you get, or you pick your first job? Like, did you start liking or, you know, certain industries? Like, how did how did you figure that out? Yeah, I mean, as a kid, I was also in addition to entrepreneurship, I just love stocks. Um, I would like, you know, track stocks when I was like started 10 years old, keep a journal of like stock prices and things. 
And then I started getting into like, believe it or not, uh, you know, uh, stock options and derivatives when I was like in middle school. <laughs> so I wouldn't read any books in school, wouldn't study, but I would read like a book on like stock options. Like this is like in seventh grade and I loved math and I was just fascinated by it. And so uh, when I went to college, there was no, I, I would have loved to be an entrepreneur or go work at a startup, but it really wasn't a thing back in 93. Um, and so I loved stocks and went to work at a bank, Bankers Trust. Okay. And uh, I thought, you know, I was going to work at a bank and be with the traders and everything. And I show up at Bankers Trust day one and they're like, yeah, um, you need to fax and then you need to like, I'm like, wait, what? He's like, yeah, you're in the back office, my friend. And I'm like, oh shit, I just went to school. And I'm like going to the office and like faxing, you know, trade confirmations all day. And uh, that was a big wake up call. That's when like, it really started to hit me. Like I gotta like take it to the next level, you know? But listen, everyone start. I, I think life's about finding out what you don't want to do as much as what you want to do, right? Because, oh, you know, we never know. And as you get older, things change. So you, you did it and you, it, it pushed it to the next thing. So what happened after Bankers Trust? Like what, what sparked you to become the entrepreneur that we all know you are today from, you know, loving math, you know, getting through college? Uh, how did that uh, yeah, after know. after a couple of years at Bankers Trust, this uh, new field was emerging called financial risk management, where banks were hiring people to analyze the bank's risk, currency, yeah. stocks, bonds, all that's derivatives and stuff. And I was really interested in that. It was a new field. So I went to work at Credit Suisse First Boston in risk management. And um, this was my first entrepreneurial thing. This is a few years after graduation. Three, like three years after, but um, there was no way to get certified as a financial risk manager. There was a CPA, CFA, all these, you know, um, acronyms, but nothing, nothing to be certified. So, you know, I was talking, you know, with my, with my boss there and said, Hey, um, we should, we should just make a, make a, make, make up an exam and certify people. And uh, it was really funny because everyone was like, wait a second, who, you can't just certify people. Who's going to take your certification exam? Like you, like who's the body behind the certification? And I said, oh, good point. So we created a body. We called it the Global Association of Risk Professionals, GARP. We created a website. And then we said, okay, well, that's the body that's behind the exam. And I said, yeah, but you just created that. You just created that body. That's not like a recognized body. You, that's, you just made that up. I said, yeah, but okay, but now it's a body and that's the body that's going to certify people. So um, this is like the great story of what I like to say is putting the cart in front of the horse. You know, they say, you know, you shouldn't. In this case, I would highly recommend it. And as an entrepreneur, it's been very successful doing this, but we basically wrote a outline of all the things that are going to be on this exam to certify you. And we picked a date a year out in New York City and said, okay, on May 16th, New York City, we're, we're given the exam. It's $550. Send the check here. Here are the topics. And we just did that one weekend. And then we started getting checks, check after check, after check, after check. With, like, without really having a body, like it's almost like putting up an internet site with no product, right? I don't yeah. have a product yet, right? Pretty <laughs> much, right? <laughs> exactly. We just started getting these checks and we were laughing because we just kept getting check after check after check after check. And we're like, all right, well, I guess we're the body now and we got to make this test. And so we hired a bunch of like really prestigious professors to write this exam. And we wrote the exam and we showed up on May 16th in New York City, administered, administered the exam, collected them, went back home, sat down. And like the one thing we forgot was who do we pass and who do we fail? We never really figured that out. So we're just thinking there, oh, like, God. you know what? Let's just pass the top half. We'll fail the bottom half. So that's what we did. We printed out these certificates that said, you know, you're certified and we sent them out to people. And now, you know, <laughs> that was back in, I don't know, like the late nineties. Yeah. We're, we're now 25 years later 
this exam is still administered in 50 countries around the world. No way. That's that's <laughs> nuts. That's absolutely nuts. That is the the horse before the car. That's like crazy. <laughs> did you sell this thing or like what the oh, how, we, it, the the, the uh, association was a not for profit association. Right. And we were making a lot of money on this on this exam and people felt like, hey, like you shouldn't be making money on this. And we're like, all right, fine. And we gave it, we gave it to the uh to the association. Um, it was a fun, it was a fun run, great experience. I and, love that. Talk about thinking on the fly. Yeah, that was a great, a great lesson on entrepreneurship. Like people think that they need to have it all figured out or like a business plan or like we got to like raise money or sometimes you just jump, you know, and you just, you have an idea and you just throw it at the wall and see if it sticks. And if it does, then you worry about. What jump you like your company today that does dynamic ticketing in stadiums. That's yeah. a different <laughs> jump. But I, 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 I agree. I, I, I think that every startup I'm in that I invested in, I'm in multiple is not the same thing I signed up for when it first started. It's always pivoted to a whole new thing, not completely off the rails, but in some actually completely yeah. off the rails, but yeah. that's how this goes. By the way, the best entrepreneurs are able to adapt fast to new information. That's really important. It's like every day you're getting new signals, new signals. Can you listen to those signals and not be stubborn and be open-minded and reassess and if you have to make a hard pivot, make it right. Like that is, that's one of the most challenging, like um, areas of entrepreneurship. Well, it's, it's like you at, and we'll go to diapers.com. I know you also sold a business to tops, but I want to, you know, move this along so we can get to wonder and, and talk a, a bunch about that. But you figured out how to ship something more efficient with empty space. Like I try at least every piece of space I have in my buildings, right? Like how am I yeah. going to get the best NOI for the product? It's the same concept. So like when you got into this, you didn't think that's what it was. How did you figure that out? And what in your like inside felt you could actually compete with Amazon at that point in time with a product that, you know, you're starting from scratch. Yeah, this was back in 2005. So yeah, Amazon already had about a seven year head start. But Amazon, believe it or not, wasn't really selling diapers online. And the prices for the diapers they did were like crazy high. And we had a simple like thesis, like hypothesis that that customers would love to buy their diapers online if it were the same prices in the store, because it's a commodity. Like you yeah. don't need to see the diapers. They're bulky, they're heavy. And we felt like, why wouldn't customers buy all their diapers online? Why why do they want to go in the store and carry this bulky thing? But on the flip side, you know, we knew nothing about retail. We would ask people and say, hey, we're thinking about selling diapers online. And people said, are you crazy? They're a lost leader in Walmart. Walmart loses money on diapers. You, If you try to ship them, you're going to get destroyed. Like there's no margin in diapers. And then I thought, and and I remember with, with, with Vinny as well, my co-founder, and, and we were talking and thinking, Wait, they're they're a loss leader for brick and mortar because they drive traffic into the store. And the store has, in Walmart's case, a hundred thousand products. Doesn't that mean we can use diapers as a loss leader online? But instead of offering a hundred thousand products, we would offer a hundred million. Like that was the thesis, like the big high level. Yeah, the high we level, can yeah. To lose more money if we can upsell more products. And so that was how we started. So we um you know, we would Procter and Gamble, who is the main seller of diapers, you know, Pampers and stuff. They yep. they basically would not. They refused to sell us diapers, and we said why, and they said because the business is never going to work, and we just don't want to be caught up in a business that's not going to work. So right. it's like okay, fine, we'll go to uh, BJ's uh, Wholesale Club and Costco, and we'll buy the diapers, and then we'll sell them. So every order that we sold on the website, we would go to so that was your did. So you literally said, okay, I'm going to just go clean out Costco yep. with diapers. And that's yep. your, that's your sort of warehouse. That was your, that, that was, was your warehouse. warehouse. We would basically sell the diapers first and then go there, buy them, put a label on them and then ship them out. Here that's you it. are horse before the cart again. Yep. <laughs> yeah. The theme. That's right? a theme. I'm seeing a theme in you. <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, so, so then what happened was two years have gone by. We're now doing 
like over $10 million a year in diapers. Procter and Gamble still won't sell us, but now we're going to Costco and BJ's and we're having to buy diapers from multiple BJ's and Costco's. And we're driving like an 18 wheeler over there to fill up the thing. <laughs> oh it was impossible. Like it was so good. We could not do it anymore. And we had a deal at uh, BJ's where uh, the store manager said, Hey, I will load the diapers onto the truck for you because, you know, BJ's and Costco, they don't load it on a truck, right? You got to like put it in the car. Right. And out. Yeah. He said, uh, we'll load it on the truck for you, but you have to leave me some diapers for my customers. So that was the deal. And then one day, Vinny and I were talking and we're like, man, we we can't, we, we, we can't do this. Procter & Gamble's not going to sell us. We need, we need some way to get these diapers. So we decided to change strategy and we went into the store and we said, all right, we're, we're, we can't do this anymore. Leave you diapers. We're taking all your diapers. You're going to, nothing's left. We're taking every one of them. He said, well, then I'm not going to load them on the truck. So like, fine. So me and Vinny <laughs> had to load up like literally like a thousand boxes of diapers, like <laughs> the thing there. And we we're like, it's who's going to blink first, you know, because we would clear out every box and they'd have nothing for customers, but we'd have to do all this labor. And then maybe like a week later, he like basically said, hey, guys, you cannot take all my diapers. And we said, guys, guy, like, listen, just call Procter & Gamble. That's your customer. Tell them we're causing you pain. Please sell us. And that's what he did. He called Procter & Gamble and told Procter & Gamble to sell us because we were killing their business. And so we got a call from Procter & Gamble and they said, hey, one of our very important customers. Right asked us to sell you. So we're going to do that, but we still think your business is shit and it's never going to work, but we're doing our, our good, very good customer a favor. And, and think about it. You're, and you're doing all this for a product that makes absolutely no money. Yeah. Like, 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 so, all right. So that happens. And obviously you build up this brand and you build, I guess, all the other products around it. And then yeah. you had your own logistics and you figured out, which I thought was the the, the most interesting part of this story, how to ship things more efficient. Yep. So explain how you, you got your product where now you can actually order it. You built these other products around it. And then what you were sort of not making money on the shipping part. So now that's the next problem, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we, we try to pull out every, every penny we could out of the logistics. So it started with creating some software we called Boxum, which would take all the products in a customer's order and figure out what is the minimum box size that you can fit all the products in. And we had 23 or 26 different box sizes. Right. And the system would tell you box 24. And you look at the products and you say, hey, no way these products can fit in this box. It's not gonna fit. But then you put it the right way and you're like, oh shit, it actually fit. Um, and you know, shipping costs were not done by weight, they were done by the size of the box. And so every inch that we can shrink the box, we'd save a lot of shipping. And so that was like one thing we did. We did a bunch of things. Then we, we were the first company to use Kiva Robotics, which were these robots in the warehouse that would go fetch the product and bring it to you to put in Got the it. box. Um, so we, we did a bunch of like really cool things around logistics to pull out every penny from the supply chain. We also strategically had all the warehouse located in the optimal areas in the U S so that we can get um, about 70% of the country overnight ground delivery. Um, and that was really the key to the success of the business. It was great prices and, and free overnight delivery of, of diapers, wipes, formula, and all the baby stuff. So. And was the software created to box them something that's in the market today? The other. No, that was, people... that was proprietary. And, and that was when we sold it to Amazon that went there. All right. And then you sold to Amazon. It wasn't, listen, as successful as that was, I know that wasn't a happy moment for you, right? You uh, obviously, you know, were pushed to sell and it happened. And then Walmart comes into play, but uh, just tell them like why, you know, here you go, you, you sold yeah, something for more than people. Money. Yeah. It was life-changing money, you know, life-changing money. I mean, I had not made very much money up until that point. So a $550 million sale was, was, uh, you know, life-changing generational kind of wealth kind of stuff for us and for our family. And it was probably one of the most depressing days of my life was literally Not after that sale, which is, which is, 
hard to believe because I'm like, really? Why, why was I, you know, that was, but it was, we were so focused on the mission and we loved building that company. And we felt like it, it was like, um, you know, on its way to become a better, a better version of Amazon. And we, we loved it. We truly loved it. We loved the people. We loved the mission, the culture that we had created. And we put sweat and, and tears into that business and we just, it was a gut wrenching to have to sell it for uh, for five hundred fifty million, which sounds like you know I'm sure a big number, but but uh, you know it's just. It was- and, and I love what you're saying here because I know when you were younger and you went to that bank, I heard you say you were a mercenary, and like we just heard you say what a missionary or having a mission. Feels I know. Like, I learned, I to learned, the point where you're not even happy making five hundred fifty million dollars. No, and it's so. just funny because it's the opposite. Like you said, I. Basically, I grew up a mercenary without even knowing it. Like my dad and and growing up without money, like you, you sort of like you just think of like working is like money, and you're gonna like get money, and it's money, 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 money. Like you, you don't <laughs> as a kid, right? You, like I don't know. It was just it was it was just about the money. And and when I went to Bankish Trust, um, for whatever reason, I had money goals, and I. And I posted it, you know, six figures by 26, seven figures by 37, eight figures by 48. This is right after I got out of school. I was yep. like, I was like eight figures by 48, you know, and I had these well, goals. At least you had a goal. That was, you yeah. know, you and had it was a goal. All money related. And uh, in banking, it doesn't like it, 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 it furthers your, your, your mercenary thinking, right? Banking is just money, money, money. The, the product's money. Everything's money, right? Yep. And the culture is terrible. And it wasn't until I became an entrepreneur, I really got back to like what was inherent in my DNA, which was building something from nothing and the love that you get from building something. And, you know, I experienced it first with with the first startups before diapers.com. And then by diapers.com, I had kind of switched. Like, it was like, you know what? Like, I, I made a lot of money in banking and it didn't change my happiness. It was like, it was empty. Yeah. And- and I and I was so happy in the startups, building it and things. And in diapers.com, probably one of the happiest time I ever was in my career. And I wasn't getting paid a salary. And you know, it was just loving. But everyone it. listened to that. It was the happiest time in his career when everything was going wrong, trying to make it right. Which I I like yeah. that's what makes you know entrepreneurs entrepreneurs. And, yeah. and I think in any journey of anybody's life, that's what yeah. makes and then, and then I realized, I mean, like missionary mercenary they sound like like mercenary sounds bad i don't think it's a bad term it's basically where your motivation comes from like i think in both cases missionaries want to make money i'm not talking about missionary like some sort of like you know church retreat or something like it, it, it's it, it's literally what is the driving motivational force are you yep. driven and motivated by just making a buck or you're driven or motivated by the mission itself and yeah, if you achieve the mission, you're going to make a lot of money, but it's like, what is the primary motivator, you know? And, and, you know, when I was in banking, the primary motivator was definitely money. Yeah. And, and when I was in entrepreneurship, it was, it was definitely the mission of the, of the business, the customers and employees. Well, and cause was, you have a product, like if you're yeah. in a bank, it's money. Like you said, that's yeah. the product. Yeah. No, was you have happy. some, you're creating from nothing. That's, you know, it's easier to get a, a, be, a bigger mission around that, right? Yeah. By mind. the way, mission, it turns out, you know, I made a lot of money, you know, with the with the focus, the driving focus being being mission. Um, but I knew I I was definitely a missionary when we sold that business and was depressed. We actually, Vinny and I were like, should be celebrating, right? And we're like, hey, should we go out and get a drink? And it's like, no, you want, no, I don't want to be the man. Let's um, just- You depressed. were bummed out. It, you were bummed it out. I, I don't blame you. I, I, if you, you know, the story makes sense. You sort of were pushed to do something. All right. So you do that successful as hell. And then you're like, okay, you know what? Why don't we just create a company that like just competes against the biggest growth company on the planet, which is jet.com, which taking all the lessons you learn, right. And sort of what you want to do when you do that. Uh, what made you do that? Was it just that, yearning that you didn't feel good about this last deal yeah, or yeah. yeah i spent two years in amazon and i just felt like you know there was some unfinished business in e-commerce in retail got but, it um i knew nothing about retail in 2005 when it started diapers.com and here it was 2013 eight years later 
I had built diapers, sold it, worked inside Amazon. It was like, I didn't feel done. Like I wasn't ready to go into a new industry. I had an idea for, for jet.com on how to compete with Amazon and uh, was able to raise a, a ton of capital and hired some great people that knew e-commerce, all the people I'd known. And we just went at it again. Um, and um, in this case, it was a little bit, you know, shorter timeline than we expected. It was, you know, two years uh, before we before we sold it to Walmart. And in this case, you know, last time I said we were depressed. In this case, it wasn't depressing at all. It was very uh, invigorating and exciting because Walmart um, basically had the same vision, the same the same mission that we had, uh, which was to build this this you know in, incredible formidable competitor to to, to Amazon. And Walmart said, hey, we have capital. We're going to give you the keys. Um, we want you to, to help turn walmart.com uh, into a, a real legitimate, formidable competitor to Amazon. And that for us was like super motivating. Like it wasn't, that's why it wasn't like about jet.com. It was about the broader, bigger mission, which was let's let's go out there and build something that and show the world that we can compete with Amazon um, at, with their scale. And so that was the motivating Driving. Well, you got a second chance, really. If you really, yeah. I mean, but you took, if you didn't take that initiative and believe in yourself again, right? And I call these B hags that you do, like big, hairy, audacious goal. I mean, one after the other, after the other. But if you didn't go do that, you never would have had that chance to actually fulfill this yearning of not being able to like have that fun and create that company, yeah. which is and great. I really enjoyed, you know, working with our team to, to help walmart.com you know, build in, into a really big, formidable competitor. Like that was fun. We did that for over four years and, uh, and learned a ton about how to scale, um, you know, a really big business to an even yep. bigger business and, and how to, you know, I had had a lot of experience in like sort of that big corporate kind of like infrastructure world and learned, just learned a ton and felt like uh, now I was finished with retail. <laughs> so <laughs> after diapers, Amazon, Jet, Walmart. Now I've been at it for, you know, call it, um, you know, 2005 to 2000. Um, you were a digital native, like, 20, you know, yeah, you're, yeah, 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 basically. you're a digital native. Yeah, it's been 15 years of in retail. And uh, I was I was sort of done with retail. I felt like I've, I've done that, been there. And now it was time, but I wasn't done with entrepreneurship. So it was time to disrupt or attempt to disrupt an entirely new new industry and all right, so let's well. talk about that this is exciting and this is the b-hag of all b-hags because you have to scale infrastructure in a different way it's not just one warehouse and it's yeah. not an online thing that you can scale nationally in a much faster quicker pace it's so it's wonder and wonder is what i said at the beginning it's bringing and that maybe could be your new tagline chefs and cuisine to your front door right so talk to us about that. And like, you're done with retail. This is not retail, but it's food, right? But, you know, it's still in the consumer space. Yeah, it's, really. it's funny right. though, um, you know, in being in retail, we used to talk about how logistically intensive the business is and how hard it is. And now after doing Wonder, I look back on retail and it makes me laugh because we would buy a box of diapers from Procter & Gamble. It could sit in a warehouse for a year, never goes bad. Yeah. Slap a label on it and yep. hand it to UPS. Like it doesn't seem it doesn't seem that hard, you know, relative to now what we're dealing with, you know, you're buying like a head of lettuce. The head of lettuce you have to inspect because every head of lettuce is different. The head of lettuce like only lasts like a week. And you have to the shelf you life. Have to, shelf. You have to make it, yeah, and you have to yeah. cook something with it. And then you have to like deliver it to a customer uh, on time. Like it's it's a very very sophisticated logistic supply chain problem. Um, probably got it's got to be one of the most um, in, in, in any industry. Well, you're gonna have the whole digital thing along with you know having you know food logistics driving warehouses preparation. I mean, I, I, like it's, yeah. it's almost like a master class. <laughs> in like everything that you need to do in one business all at once and, yeah. and from scratch, basically. Yep. Yeah. And, and, you know, the, the, the big vision though is like, you know, if you think about, you know, what, what McDonald's and, and Burger King and Wendy's and Kentucky fried chicken, all these, they, they basically systematized 
the cooking of, you know, sort of like what they call fast food. Like, you know, in the case of McDonald's, it was like taking the diner where people would go to the diner and get a burger and fries. They yeah. systematized that and made it so it was much more accessible in terms of price and convenience, right? Yeah. And then it just boom from there. Um, what we're trying to do here at Wonder, what we are doing is we're systematizing not fast food, but we're systematizing great food. We're making and giving customers access to great food across every cuisine, from steak to pizza to burgers to Chinese, Japanese, Mexican, Indian, Italian, systematizing this great food so that we can deliver to you at a great price really fast and conveniently. And yeah. so that requires, requires an incredible investment in culinary engineering and food science. And that's where we've we've invested you know, a couple hundred million to date just in the culinary engineering and food science to be able to cook food really high quality, really fast with lowly trained labor. So we can cook a Bobby Flay steak, for example, with the push of a button in five minutes to perfect temp every time. Um, exactly as if you were going in Bobby Flay Steakhouse. Um, and that's really the that's really the magic of wonder. How did you so you have 30 of these unbelievable like chefs in their IP? How do you convince someone to trust you with their life's work on yeah. a truck delivering it to someone's home in like Colts Neck or wherever they live? Right. How, how, how do you like for real? Like how I mean, do you do honestly, that? It started it started with one chef and then two, right? But but right. The, you know, the, the the first chef, Bobby Flay, um, you know, we needed to prove it to him. So we brought him in and he tried the steak and he, you know, thought the steak was, you know, like eating in a steakhouse. And you know, he'll tell you he, the steak was great. Um, and he said, you know, I, I don't know how you're going to cook this, though, on, on a truck in front of somebody's home. And we said, Bobby, that steak you're eating, that was that was cooked with the push of a button outside uh, outside somebody's home. You know, that it's just there's there's no open stove. There's no flame. I was just push button in a high speed impingement oven with 550 degree temperature and 50 mile an hour winds. And by programming the oven to change the wind speed and the temperature uh, using special equipment that you put in the oven and cook the steak on, you're able to replicate the same quality um, with, without any deviation. I think once once he realized that that was possible is when he, he got on board and became a part of the company. And he's he's been a great supporter, advisor, helper to me personally. Um, and, you know, from there, um, the same story with 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 other chefs, Nancy Silverton, Pizzeria Mozza from LA, same thing, you know, the pizza is, is cooked with the push of a button. And it's phenomenal. You know, this is great, great. We created food. algorithms for food, like only you. Yeah, only yeah. you would create that. Like <laughs> all the software experience, you're, you're applying it to food. You know, it's so funny. It's like, the one dreaded question my wife and I always have every night is like, what are we going to have for dinner? Right? Like mm -hmm. who's picking it up? Who's, are, are we going to, it's, it's just a pain in the neck. Having this is, is really, I mean, you are solving a serious home life issue. I mean, there, without even a question, I know uh, you're in Westfield, right? So wh where are yeah. the markets that this is happening? This is right How now. Seeing in traction and sort of adoption. For, yeah, it's in the Essex Union County, New Jersey. So, like you said, Westfield, Summit, West yeah. Park, it's like some of, all that that whole area. Then up, we went up in Bergen County, and uh, just recently went into Westchester County, New York. So yeah. we're really starting starting to expand. And what's been your biggest challenge? I mean, in Wonder to date, in your mind. I mean, the biggest challenge is just the culinary engineering food science and to be able to cook great food fast with the touch of a button. Um, it just takes incredible amount of iterations and changing the ingredients and changing, you know, sick. We looked at 60 different cheeses with different moisturization content and how to like ferment the yeast of the, for the crust and how you, I mean, it's just like constant iteration um, and trying to, to replicate it. And that, that was super challenging. Um, and then you have the, the logistics piece you know, be able to to order all the raw materials, have no waste, you know, be able to to cook the food on the right day, to be in stock at a really high in stock rate so the customers always have food available. Like there's a lot of like logistics and and um you know sophistication around the supply chain that we're, you know, learning. Yeah, I thought you would say labor. I mean, like that it's like the number one issue every business. No, but we don't now. need a lot of labor, but we don't need a lot of labor. That's the whole that's the magic of the model. It's uh 
you know, I, I, for example, myself, you know, got trained up on cooking. Now I've never cooked, but I got trained up and was able to cook an entire restaurant in about two hours and went out on the road and took the truck out myself and went. Oh, you did? Oh, I love that. But only two hours of training. So like when we say push to the button, we really mean it. Like, um, it, it, you know that movie, uh, uh, that show, Undercover Boss. I I know it. That, yeah. That's uh, you didn't even do. You did that on your own. You didn't even have to be on the show. I love that. The very first order. Very first order. I'm excited. I give the woman the the bag, and I'm walking. I'm like, thank you. I literally <laughs> sprained my ankle. Go down hard. Oh right my god, that's terrible. right on the driveway. <laughs> you were that excited. You tripped on yourself. I, I literally, it. and she's like, "Oh, you okay?" I was literally. Flat on my face, the very first order. Um, but uh, so, how do you? So, so I, I love this idea, and I, I'm, I'm like, you know, it's, it's. I, I know some people in Westfield, actually, some people that work at my company as well. They love it, like they absolutely love it. The kids go to bed, they do their little order, it comes freshly cooked, or they have a nice little family dinner. The night set, you know, there most people, two fam- people are working today. It's you know, it's a busy world out there. You're 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 creating a lot of de-stressing opportunities for families. I think that should be one of your missions for this. Oh, is to de-stress the family, de-stress right? The family. I hear you. Yep. So that's yeah. good. So uh all right. Well, how can people learn more about Wonder? Uh, you know, because obviously we want as many people to order from yeah, them I mean, as possible. If you're in is those it an if app? three counties, it's an app and it's you know, just get the Wonder app. And uh, enter your address there, and you can you can see all the restaurants. And again, um, it's as simple. It's like uh, all on demand, so you don't have to pre-order. You basically pull up the app. It'll say Bobby Flay Steak is twenty minutes away. You order your steak, click on the button, the truck will pull up, cook the steak, and bring it to your door hot. The prices are um, exactly the same as what you get in a in a restaurant. So there's no extra fees. It's not expensive. This is not like a special occasion thing. This is meant to be, you know, do it multiple times a week. This is like, yeah, it's sticky multiple yeah. times. You've got, I know, you've got I, everyday meals, like, you know, um, could be like a, a you know, taqueria is a, a sort of Mexican family style. We've got a family style, like chicken, fish dinners and things that are like 50 bucks for a family. Like it's, um, you know, you, you can definitely eat uh, wonder multiple time, multiple uh, nights, nights a week. No problem. And knowing you, right. I know this is the core product now, but. How do you scale all this IP? You know, now that you have all these beautiful recipes, are you going to s- scale them in different ways to generate other potential yeah, offerings? A B two B business now, where we'll give our ovens to hotels, hospitals, golf clubs, marinas, stadiums, and then we send our our food, and then somebody there could very simply push a button and turn out turn out great food. So that's a, a big part of our business and growing fast. You'll have a nice arena that you're involved in to try all this stuff out in Minnesota. Yeah, I guess, no, right? I can't wait. I can't wait to that's get so it. Good. That's so good. That's so good. So, so Mark, I really appreciate you doing this. I know how busy you are, but it's fascinating. It's like uh, exciting to, to hear how you think through these ideas. I can feel your passion, which I love and energy. You know, you want to be around that. So thanks so much for doing this. Thanks, John. It was great to be on the show and great questions. I appreciate it. Thank you.